Are, are you asking that question? Why is God not answering all of my prayers or sometimes not seem to answer my prayers? And second, that is a very big argument that you will hear all the time over and over again. Why does God allow evil to prosper while the righteous suffer? These two big questions have been from generation to generation disturbing many, many people. Many people. I told you just a few weeks ago the man that I met on the train that could quote some uh, one, you know, in Psalm 23 just by memory and, and, man, and Mandarin told me exactly if God is good, why is there so much evil in this world? So I cannot believe in God because he knew he knew he could quote the Psalms but he could not put his trust in God it's for exactly the same thing so today we're going to see how the prophet Habakkuk questioned God with these same sorts of of questions and go to next slides Habakkuk 1 1 to 4 and this is how the book starts the prophecy or the burden the, pro the word prophecy here and uh, King James and other old, older versions says the burden. So the prophecy or the message that he has received was very heavy. It was like a burden, like very heavy on him th that the prophet saw. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you idly look at wrongdoing. In other words, you're doing nothing. Destructions and violence are before me. Therefore, the law is paralyzed. This is what we see in this world and our society right now. Justice never seems to prevail. The wicked surrounds or outnumbers the righteous so that justice is perverted. So when we look at the prophet Habakkuk, if you read this book, it's short, three chapters. He's a minor prophet. But you will find out something unique about him. He's not our typical prophet. Why, why do I say that? Because usually, as we know, prophets are declaring out loud the message of the Lord to the people. He is speaking for God against evil in the world. But at this point in the text, Habakkuk is not declaring anything. He's questioning God. He's, he's criticizing God. He's questioning God. He's kind of accusing God in, in a way. He's not declaring to you the counsel of God. He's turning to God and he doesn't understand and he's not very happy with God. He asked the Lord how long evil would be allowed to go unpunished. And that's why sometimes uh, Habakkuk is called the, the, the doubting Thomas of the Old Testament because he approached God with a lot of questions. In verse 1 to 4, we find phrases with quite an accusing tone, and you will see that the questions here. You do not listen. You do not save. Why do you make me look at this all injustice? Injustice never prevails. So that's, that's very uh, accusing tone that we can see when he addressed God. The prophet cannot understand that God does not punish evil. Why is evil going on in our society? So he's not able to accept that. Habakkuk was frustrated not only over the wickedness of his society, but mainly over the fact that God was being slow to settle these, these unjust situations. And we feel like that too. Are we honest this morning? I think many of us this morning, we are, we are impatient. And we see things, especially when it comes against, against us. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5 to 6. Next slide. Look at the nation and watch and be utterly amazed. Now God is talking to him. For I am going to do something in your days. Okay, so God was not deaf. God is, was listening, and God was working, but Habakkuk didn't know that. So when you are praying, be careful how you're praying. God may, may seem to be slow. God may seem to not be listening or not be working, but God has been listening, and God has been uh, working all along. He says, I'm going to do something, and you will be utterly amazed by what I'm going, I'm going to do. And this is what God says, I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if I told you. And sometimes this is, this is the reason why God does not 
tell us everything because we could not either accept it, we could not comprehend why is God acting in this way instead of uh, the way that we, we thought he should have. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people. Oh, that is what will make him utterly amazed. The people of Judah were wicked. They were violent to the land, crime, lies, the justice was perverted. So God, uh, Habakkuk was concerned and wanted God to deal with the issues of unrighteousness and justice in his society and among his people. But now God says, hey, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to punish this wickedness in your society by a, a foreign nation that is coming over and will destroy everything and take them in captivity. And again, Habakkuk is really more frustrated now because that's not what he was hoping for. He was hoping maybe that God would sort it out, uh, remove some leaders, uh, bring a revival in the land. Instead, he's going to bring a more wicked people then the people of Israel to come and deal with these issues and he is not able to understand that. The Lord will use the Babylonian to punish uh, Judea. In other words, God says to Habakkuk, Habakkuk, you accuse me of keeping silence, but I have not been silent. I have my own agenda. But the answer is so different from what you expect that you will not even recognize it or believe it when I tell you. And that is how many times we feel. God says, I'm going to do something. I am raising up the Babylonians. It's not that God did not have a plan. It's not that God was not doing anything. God was working behind the scene. And he is always much in charge of history. He, was, he knew exactly what to do. He knew what was happening in the land. He was not too slow. He was not too late. Because the Bible tells us in the New Testament that it is to our advantage that God is patient. God always, over and over, and we have seen it in previous message, has sent his prophet the in, the out, over generations, hundreds of years. So God has been patient trying to bring back his people to himself. So when you ask your qu difficult questions to God, are you ready to hear God's unexpected answers sometimes? Or you only are prepared to hear God's answer the way you want him to answer? I, I feel like that. When I pray to God, I'm asking him something, and I already know what I wish him to do. And I'm expecting him to do it because I've been asking him, because I'm his child, because, uh, I, because I know what I want. And, and you are the same too. But God may have something else in mind. So understand that when God answers our prayers in an unexpected way, we need to trust him. And this is what we are going to learn. Let's go to the next slide. Verse 12. The next section is very important because it will tell us this book is small, but has a lot of principle for us today that we can learn. Uh, it will tell us how to handle this kind of problem, the difficulty to answer, to, to recognize God's answer, God's working that are unusual to us. What do you do when you are confronted with this sort of crisis to your faith? The, the things that you feel that God is not listening, God is not answering, or he is answering in a way that is totally contrary to what you were expecting him. So let's look at what we, we read in verse 12. God, Habakkuk is now responding to God. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We will not die, O Lord. You have appointed the Chaldeans to execute your judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them to correct and chastise. But your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? Well, again, we have many questions in verse 12, 13, including in verse 17, and you see it uh, in the next click uh, here. Lord, are you not from everlasting? You, you know his story. You've been moving in the past through, the, through the, the, the history of your people, Israel. You have been saving them. Lord, you can do it again. So why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why do you keep silent? Nothing is happening. And w will, you, will you let them get away with mercilessly killing nations forever? 
And that is why in verse 13 he says, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. God doesn't tolerate evil. God is just. God is holy. That is what he says. You are holy. Means absence of evil. It's a total integrity. He is pure. He is holy. And he is perfectly righteous. So you cannot let it go on and go on like this. So why is it happening like this? So for us, we need to learn from this verse 12 and 13. This is important that we approach God in a similar manner. Why? Because when we go through confusions and we don't know, we're out of our resources, we're out of time, and we don't know how to get out of this crisis and our faith. Look at what uh, Habakkuk has done and do the same thing. Recall the things that you know about God. You knew God. You've been here a long time. You've been reading the Bible. You've been reading the Psalms. You've been reading about the character of God. You've maybe taken the foundation classes. So you know a lot of truth about God. So recall the things that you know about God's character. Because all the names that he used here are declaration of how he perceived the character of God. Don't try to solve the problem when you are emotionally troubled. This is a very good advice that was given to me in the past. Because when you are high in emotion or low in emotion, depressed or a a aggressively angry, and you want to act right now, you will make a worse mistake. You will make your situation worse. Never act, never react when you are high or low emotionally. Don't try to solve. Back away from the problem. For me, sometimes when I feel very tense over something, I feel pressure, I feel something is unfair, usually I tell myself, a night of sleep will do me good. I will take at least that one night. I'm not trying to think about it. I'm going to sleep that night. And tomorrow morning, I will think about it again. And usually it helps, uh, it helps me a lot. Go back to what you know about God and his character from the revelation of scriptures and from your own life experience. And don't let fear paralyze you. Don't let fear, don't let depression, don't let negative feeling take over. Verse 12 says, Lord means sovereign. You are sovereign. You are above. You are the most high. You are almighty. My God, my holy one. It's me. It's personal. We have that relationship together. Holy one, you, are, you have this absolute sense of justice. My rock I indicate protection, safety, and the strength of, of the Lord that is declared. So Habakkuk also recall that God is eternal, everlasting. God has always been part of his story. God has always been in control of his world. God has always been continuing to fulfill his plan according to his agenda. And we don't see that happening. Then apply what you know about the character of God to the problem. And that is what he says, we will not die. We will not die because I know how God you are. You're my rock. You are the only one. Your eyes are too pure. You will not let evil de destroy us forever. We will not die. And he, this is a declaration of his faith. Let's go next. In the chapter 2. Now Habakkuk is going to wait to let God sort out this confusion that he has. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1 to 4. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and I will look out to see or I will wait to see what he will say to me or in me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. I've been complaining to God, now I'm stepping back, I'm going to my watch post tower, going to retire by myself, no other people, no other voice. No other activities. I'm going alone with God. And I'm going to go stay there. I am determined. I'm going to stay there until the Lord speaks to me. I know some pastors that have been doing that. Going to a log cabin. I have some friends. They went to a log cabin for a number of days. Until they had received some, some answers to their prayers. I have done that also in the past. Before I, I launched out to mission with my family, I took 40 days out. 40 days. 
I, wa I was fasting, I was praying, I spent nights in prayer, I even, I told you in the past, I went to spend a night in the mountain top in the dark of the forest alone with God. I really, I was determined to make sure I was hearing from the Lord. And many times I go in the forest, I go in the uh, water reservoir near Fanling, I go to certain place where I just hear the sound of nature, I am by myself and I speak to God and I ask God to uh, intervene. And my life has been impacted in a time such as this. I told you at one point, a year and a half after I came to Hong Kong, I had a problem with one of my daughter and I was really confused. Is it because we have moved the family to Hong Kong that she is rebelling against you, Lord? Should we return to Canada? Should we stay here? What am I to do? I'm the leader of the family, so what am I to do? That is exactly what I have done. I went on the watch post. I went to fast and pray. I was preaching to a church in another city. I confided in the friends, the, the pastors and his wife about this. They prayed with me. And every day when I was not preaching, I was going aside in the forest alone with God. And twice in two days, one day and the next day, God spoke to me very clearly. I called my wife and I says, I know what we are to do. There was no question asked after that. So that is what he says. I am determined. He says, I will take my stand. I will st stay there and I will wait to hear from the Lord. So that what he, he would do. This is very important. This is repeated. I will. I will. I want to. And if you want to hear from God, if you want to understand God, you need to follow his advice. This is a difficult time. He was confused. He's a man of God who knows God, but he still has a lot of things he does not understand or cannot agree. And some of us, we all go through these seasons in our lives. Uh, maybe some of you are even in such a season. This is one of the most important principles for believers today. And it is so difficult to practice that today. Because our, our time, our agendas, our work, the pressures, our, our, our dear little mobile phones and everything, they are always notifying us, look at this, look at this Facebook, your friend has texted you. And uh, we are always busy reading something, listening to something. We are never uh, in the pure. Imagine the contrast with David when he was young and he was with the sheep on the mountain for his father, the, the difference of, of, uh, of lifestyle that David would have living alone with the sheep, quiet in nature, and he could think about God, and he could receive and listen, and he could pray and express himself. That's why we have so many uh, wonderful uh, songs and psalms from him. He's been like enriched by this uh, experience with God. He took the time, he had the time. And for us, we are running, and we are running, and we are running, and we have no time to stay put with the Lord. And that is what this man this says, I will go up on the tower and I will be the watchman, I will watch for God, I will wait until He speak to me. Wow, that is something that you and I, we need to relearn in our Christian living. Amen? Amen. We may call it quiet time or devotions or some other term or daily communion with God, but this is crucial for every Christian. If you don't have it, you will always be confused. You will never understand anything about what God is doing, the working, the mysterious ways of the Lord, and the agendas of the world of the Lord. You, we will not understand. When you bring a problem to God and explain it all to Him in prayer, do you immediately get up and start worrying about it again? You bring it to God, says, God, please help me with this, and then what am I going to do now? What am I going to do next? You know, like, yes. So we, we do that, we, we do that. But then look at verse two, how it starts. And the Lord answers me. This is wonderful. This is so encouraging. There was difficult questions. The, the specific working of the Lord, the vision, what God was going to fulfill, that was like unexpected, that was like to our logic, unacceptable. But he could understand the mind of the Lord by staying put alone with the Lord. And this is something, this is precious for us this morning to hear that and to be reminded of that. And verse 2 and 3, 
It suggests that the message that Habakkuk was about to hear is very important. If you look down at some of the expression, write down the vision, make it plain. The, the herald will take it and he will run it, they will proclaim it, the message. And the appointed time speaks of the end time. It is not a lie, it will certainly come. And these are strong statements that the Lord is telling him. These phrases express urgency and certainty. God is going to do something for you. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for us. God has a plan for this time in which we live. He is working, he is fulfilling his big, big agenda for the end times. God is with us, he is the master of history. And this is what we are reminded about this morning. Though God's vision would not be fulfilled soon, like it says here, it would not delay. It says it will not be fulfilled soon, but it will be a new generation. It will not delay. It will also be something to do with, with the end. And this tells us that God always chose the perfect time. Can you say that? God chose the perfect time according to his own agenda. He has an agenda. And it, and it tells Abacus and us, wait for God's agenda. And we are not very good in waiting. Then God gives us the most life-transforming verse of the Bible, which from this little invisible book of the Old Testament is quoted and has transformed more lives in the New Testament than, than ever. And it has been quoted and it has been creating a fire in the heart of Martin Luther, the just shall live by faith. You see, in, in, in a gloomy time, in a time of confusion, this is the answer of God. You, the righteous, live, continue to live the righteous life. Continue to live by faith. Continue to put your trust in the Lord regardless of whatever. This is what God has as his message from generation to generation. When you and I are going through tough time, the just is to live by faith. Is going to continue to live the righteous life, the upright life that God uh, wants for all of us. This is the greatest the verse for bringing revival throughout history. In Romans 1, 17, it stress the righteous, the righteous. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power for the salvation of whoever um, believes. For the, the righteous shall live by faith. The righteousness come from that time. How the righteous receive the message of the gospel. In Hebrew 10, verse 36 to 39, it stress shall live. It is we are not of those who withdraw or, or step back or shrink back. We are of those who keep the faith until the end. That's the, the context of this. Because the, the righteous shall go on living. It's the long haul. It's not like a, just a short time. For all of his life, the righteous shall continue to persevere. The, the righteous will endure. The righteous will go on with his faith. That's the context in Hebrew. And then Gal Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 to 14, is, is the, the contradictions or the contrast between being justified by observing the law and rituals. No one will be justified by that. But the righteous will be justified by faith. So this one stress faith, the importance of believing to receive the blessing of Abraham in Galatians uh, chapter 3. So... Whatever we go through, God is telling to you and to me, the righteous is the person that is characterized by living by faith, walking by faith, making decisions by faith, continuing to trust no matter what. He keeps peace. He keeps, and also in this text, I did not put it because of time, but there is a big... Uh, uh, descriptions of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. They are greedy. They are arrogant. 
They are fierce, they are aggressive, they destroy everything, they destroy the trees, they destroy nature, they destroy people, and this is what they take everything for themselves. So this is a comparison. If you look at verse 4, you, you will see that the, the, how, how verse 4 is, is being read. Behold, his soul is puffed up, talking about the, the, the Babylonians. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. There's a big contradiction between the righteous and lifestyle. The, the, those who do not believe in the Lord, they become, you know, like very independent, very arrogant. They take matters into their own hand. They seek their own benefit. They don't consider other people. They, have, they are abusive. They go on to win everything for themselves. The righteous shall live by faith. The righteous lives uprightly. The righteous live for the honor of the Lord. The righteous even do is going through the valley because this is the time that God is allowing us to go through. He is okay with that. He will continue on to trust in the Lord. Hallelujah. There are only two attitudes by which we can face life. Either you will depend upon God or you will depend upon your own ability and reason out everything and be angry and aggressive. Habakkuk was shown that at a time of extreme hardship that was coming, God told him, the just shall live by faith. Talking about faith and applying it to our life this, uh, this, uh, this morning, faith. Think back about your own experience of faith. When has your faith grown? When has your faith been strengthened the most? Is it an easy time of prosperity? Happy, happy, don't worry, be happy. Jump here, jump there. It's not when your life has been strengthened the most. Your life has been strengthened the most. It's, 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 it's a fact, it's a fact. It's in the tough time. It's when it was not fun to be in that situation. But you have learned something you have applied something to your life. You came out of that situation stronger, better, uh, more experienced. You, you, you've been promoting yourself at, and, and higher. So that's what happened. Are you now going through a crisis in your faith? Are you now going through injustice? Are you now confused about something to test your faith? How can you apply this right now to your life. That's what you need to know this morning. Can you think of people surrounding you in your lifetime, either in Lighthouse here or outside, or biographies of missionaries, of great uh, theologians of the past, or, or people right now, somebody that has inspired you to live by faith? Because they themselves live by faith. Me, I have many people, I'm, I'm so grateful that I have seen people living by faith. I have been strengthened by people who live by faith. Uh, the, the, the missionary that uh, uh, before I came to Hong Kong for the very first time came to our church and, and uh, was living the life of, by faith, uh, depending on God, on the mission field, has, has made a turning point into my life. And that night when we said goodbye to them, he, he gave me a love offering. He who lives by faith. Me, I had a salary. I was a pastor. And he is the one. And, and I re refused. And he says, are you going to keep me from being blessed by God? Don't you believe that God told me to give you this? And, and it's really, I've learned something. Uh, pastor Steve uh, and Sister Mary here in Lighthouse, I have learned so much about their life. This church here where we are meeting today, it's them. It's their faith. It's their faith. You know, look at the size of this church. You know, I, 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 I pray with many pastors of big churches in Hong Kong. They do not have their own place. Of course, they have money, they rent, they are bigger than us. But when they come here, it says, oh, wow, this is paid? It belongs to you? Yes, we have no debts. We have no debts. We have a, a sanctuary. We have a place of peace. We have a place of meeting that God provided to us here in Lighthouse. We are not rich. We are not big. But God has done a miracle. But somebody needed to have the vision and the faith. 
And Pastor Steve well, and Sister Mary had that faith, and they communicated to, to you who were there at the beginning. And they, we, we are continuing to walk in their footsteps. And I remember sometimes when I was going through my own family crisis, how many people here in Hong Kong, I remember Pastor Steve, Sister Mary, uh, Aaron Rodganger, missionary to China, uh, and there were a few people, uh, even the, the, the former uh, principal of uh, Christian Alliance uh, School where my children were going, people who came into our life and through their faith, their vision, their dependence of God has created my faith to hold on to the Lord. And you have people like that and, and, to, and to your own life. Amen? Amen? And we need to think about these things because it is important. Chapter 2 ends up with another wonderful principle. But the Lord is and is holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Isn't that great? What a wonderful man of God Habakkuk was. How he was intimate with the Lord. And all of this mess up, this old chapter was like big, big problems. Woe unto the arrogant and all of this. The big chapter too is like declaring a lot of things. But it finished with this statement. But in the midst of all of this, the Lord is on his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. Do you think it is useful to keep silent before the Lord? Instead of, you know, complaining and crying out in tough times when we're confused. What setting do you have in your daily routine to provide time of silence, to enjoy silence before the Lord? Do you have that? This is so beneficial because in times of silence, you can hear him speak. You know, many times we, we read the Bible and we, when you pray, Amen, Lord, God, and more, and then, and God says here, just keep silence sometimes. It's also very beneficial. When you pray, Spend a few minutes sitting in silence. Try to practice that this week. Soak up the majesty of God. Let Him maybe speak love into your life. You know, when you're waiting for an appointment, close your eyes, quiet yourself, and try to focus on God. Exercise your mind and your heart to do certain exercises. Sometimes you need to ex force yourself to do these things because it's not you know, natural to do this. While doing even manual chores in your daily life, quiet your inner thoughts. Shoom, 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 shoom. Just focus on God's great ability. You know, the mother of John Wesley, she had many children and she was a very busy mother. She would take her apron, put it on over her head. She did not run away from her daily task. She just found God doing her task. She to just take her apron, put it over her head, oh God help me, you know, <laughs> cook this omelette or something. <laughs> Habakkuk prays and trusts the Lord. Chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. As, as he goes on and he, he, he spend time with God in silence and <coughs> his crazy mind, his busy mind, his confused mind is getting more at peace and he start to trust the Lord then we, we have this psalm or this prayer. Actually, it's more than a prayer. It's really a psalm, a song. I have heard all about you, Lord. And this time of our deep need, help us or revive your work again as you did in years gone by. And in your anger or in your wrath, remember your mercy. And this particular chapter, you will find the word wrath, anger, and angry five times. And, and the uh, following in the following words but in his prayer he says Lord now I, I get it you are going to do something against evil but as you punish evil please remember your your mercy because we depend upon mercy imagine if God would not have been merciful to us mercy is not being treated as we deserve Imagine, imagine what it would be. As the prophet thinks of all this, after he heard from God, after he focused on the great love of God, he comes to this wonderful conclusion that we will go on the next slide. 
and we're finishing with that. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 16 to 19. This is such a wonderful text. I, I hear, and this is how physically he felt before the majesty of God. He was in, in awe of before the Lord. I hear, my body trembles, my lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet, I will quietly wait for the day of trouble because this is what God says it was coming, to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet, I will, yet, 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 I will rejoice. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. And I finish with this verse from verse 19, the Amplified Version. The Lord God is my strength, my source of courage. He has made my feet steady and sure like hinds feet and makes me walk forward with spiritual confidence in my high places of challenge and responsibility. And this is so wonderful after get, getting to know the context where we started and where we are finishing with connecting with God in and, and the same way as he has. Despite the questions the prophet started, you know, remember at the beginning was quite ac accusative. It was a kind of reproaching God for not doing anything. And now at the end, he comes out, this is the conclusion of his meeting with God. This is his conclusion of spending time in silence, of, of his determination to go alone and on the tower and watch for the Lord without any other distractions. Lord, I'm not moving from you until you speak into, into my life. And he rejoiced in the salvation. So, question this morning, how can we learn to trust God like the prophet Habakkuk? How can you do it? this morning. How can I do it? Habakkuk commits to trust and praise God regardless of external circumstances. So my happiness does not depend upon my wife, my bank account, other people around me, the joyful atmosphere that we can have with friends, or success in my life, a promotion. My joy should not depend based on that. Of course, these are additions, additional blessings. We, we enjoy it. We are grateful for that. We are looking for that. But basically, my life depends much more than that. I am an eternal being. I'm going heavenward to be with Jesus. So I have many more important things. He's, de he's describing economic disaster. No fruit. No grapes, no olives, no sheep, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. And this is sometimes what strikes me when we go to mission fields where the, the, our brothers and our sisters have so much less resources than us. And how we are often so encouraged to see their smile, their joy, their zeal, their, their effectiveness in the Lord because they have been practicing what Habakkuk has been teaching us this morning. They spend time alone with God. They depend. They have learned that their success is not based on the amount of resources that they have at their disposal. It's not depend about the speed of their internet connection. It doesn't depend upon all of these things. But they have something much more important. Habakkuk's joy was not dependent on physical blessing. He found joy in his salvation. Remember Jesus tells us something similar. Rejoice that your names are written in the book of the Lamb. Rejoice about your names being written there. This is the joy you should have. Because if you have your name there, anything else really doesn't matter. Because the time we live on earth is not to be compared with the eternal time that we will spend with the Lord. Rejoice that your names are written. Habakkuk recognized God as the strength, the one who gives uh, inner, inner strength. He empowered him to go through any kind of circumstance. That's what it means. The just 
shall live by faith. There is the strength of God inside that enables us to go on, even though when it is so difficult. Like Habakkuk, we can choose to praise God in the face of anything. Amen.